Underdog stories are happening all around us, not just in the movies or on TV. There are people out there beating the odds and overcoming adversity every single day. And on this podcast, we're bringing those stories to light. This is Tyler O'Shea, and you're listening to Hustle and Motivate. I was very lucky to make my first Premier Games in Athens 2004. Uh, I went in there as the total underdog, this little Aussie. Uh, and they just went, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah Aussie, Aussie, you, you'll be right. Uh, they didn't consider me as a, as a threat. And I remember after the heats of the 800, I was on the bus back to the village and a couple of the Americans were talking to the m- number one American and they were t- talking about the race how he went and then planning tactics for the, for the final. And they were talking about the French, the Japanese, all these athletes, but they hadn't spoken about me. And they said, they went to him, who do you think your main rival will be? And he looked across the bus and pointed at me and they were like, Oh, whoops. We, are, we probably shouldn't be saying all the tactics. And, and so they went, Oh no, we'll change up. And uh, luckily for me, they actually did exactly the same tactics in the finals. So, going into the final when they actually made the same move they spoke about, I was like, brilliant. I'll just go with this. And I was lucky enough to get the gaps and uh, fall in the right spot and win the race by a 0.03 of a second, which is almost nothing. That's Richard Coleman, an Australian Paralympic athlete talking about winning his first gold medal in Athens in 2004. Richard was born with a birth defect called spina bifida and has accomplished some amazing feats in his athletic career. But what I'm most impressed with is his outlook on life. Spina bifida is a birth defect. It's the second most common uh, form of disability behind cerebral palsy. Um, I'm very lucky that I was born the way I am and I've been able to achieve what I, I have. And I think having my disability has allowed me to do what I've done. If I didn't have my disability, it wouldn't have done what I have in life. And I think... Uh, I'm very grateful for that and it's allowed me to travel the world, be successful and do the amazing things uh, that I have and, and push the boundaries of possibility and that's very lucky. Uh, I'm now supporting a lot of other people with Spina Bifida here and around the world and uh, it's so great to see so many people out achieving success. Richard always saw his disability as an advantage and growing up he got right in the mix with the other kids, playing every sport he could. Being an Aussie, if Aussies are involved in every single sport and we're just uh, mad about sports. So I just, uh, I'm still mad about sport and I've always been mad about sport, but I've been lucky that I was born with my disability. So I was, I'm, I live in Geelong, the greatest city of all. Uh, we are um, very inclusive of disability and nothing is ever too hard. So I was pretty lucky to grow up in this city where inclusion is just the main thing that happens. It's not oh, we have to, or it's a byproduct. It's it's what actually happens. Uh, so I was lucky to be involved in so many people around here who encouraged and pushed me into trying everything and got involved, uh, particularly during school days in the younger junior years. Uh, they got me involved in every sport possible, and that's why I got involved in athletics. But I think my first memories of athletics – isn't doing like those trial days. It's not doing most of the events. My first memories of athletics is just actually taking part in the school athletics days where every boy in the year would do the majority of the events. And that was what I did. And I remember my first memories of athletics is actually doing long jump, pushing down the long jump pit, trying to break and jump out of my wheelchair and land hopefully in the long jump pit. Um, And I think I did that because every other boy did it. And that was what we did. And so it was nothing out of this world to me. It was just the common thing. So I think that's why I got involved in athletics because everyone was treated equally and I loved it. I couldn't shake the vision of Richard's earliest sports memory, this little boy jumping out of his wheelchair into the long jump pit. So I asked him how he was so fearless so early on in his life. Uh, there was no barriers and that was, that's why I think I do what I do. I think you've got to push down barriers. And I think when people put on barriers, you've got to break them down and go, right, hang on. Why are you saying no or don't believe in what's possible? And I've always been told to set goals and success and drive to those goals to achieve it. And 
if you believe in it, then you will be able to achieve it no matter what. And if this kid in a wheelchair from Geelong can achieve something, then uh, yeah, anything is possible. Now back to Athens. This was Richard's first Paralympic Games of his career, and he put the world on notice, winning gold in the men's 800 meter by just 0 0.03 seconds. A, a surreal moment. Um, yeah, it was one of the things you didn't expect so early. You you were hoping to make a final or do well, uh, but to win it and to break the Paralympic record at the same time was just incredible. And Athens was a crazy experience. And I think every Paralympics has been a different experience for different reasons. Just culture and the crowds and um, expectations of quality of racing and how you're meant to go. So, yeah, I've had a different experience at each of the games. I've been lucky now to go to four, um, four Premix and they've all been different experiences and some have been great experiences, others you've had, got a lot of life le uh, lessons out of them. He learned one of those life lessons four years later at the Beijing Paralympics. I went into China, I think it was in the May leading into it and then after that was, uh, a new experience going to the Paralympics and it was full crowds and it was 100,000 in the crowd every night and for a Paralympic Games that was um, new to everyone and that was something that we were totally shocked by seeing the crowd and the, the noise and the atmosphere so I think I loved it. I got to race some of the Chinese guys there and one of the guys hadn't been home for I think it was three years and hadn't seen his family and then he was looking forward to going home and he was going home because it was he was looking forward to uh, it was rice season, so he was going home and going to be crawling through the rice paddy fields and picking rice with his family in the small farm he came from. So um, it really brought back perspective on life. Representing Australia in four Paralympics, Richard has been around the world and has met people from many different backgrounds. But they all share one thing in common, the drive to succeed. And that's the best bit, bit about the racing, like, and that's what I enjoy about getting to know these guys, not just as fierce athletes, but getting to know what they do, their families, their backgrounds, and everyone's got a crazy story of their background, why why they're in a wheelchair. And some stories are really crazy, you know, that actually happened. Uh, and so, yeah, we've all got a different perspective on life. And, and the common thing is just wanting to achieve success in life. And these guys are now, and that's the, been the best thing about sport where it's changed more around the world, particularly for Paralympic athletes, where now a lot more Paralympic athletes can live off sport and are recognised as elite athletes, where in the past it was just something on the side, where now you've got to be a full-time athlete and you've got to have the support and the financial backing to be able to achieve success. So I think that's where it's, and it's, I really do see that now from the developing countries and a lot more countries are traveling a lot more where in the past you only saw athletes once every four years at the Premier Games. Now you see guys uh, in Switzerland, you see them coming to America all the time. So now all the main races, we see guys from all over, all over the country and all over the world, which is really amazing to see. In talking to Richard and asking him about his accomplishments, I found that he kept coming back to helping others achieve success. It was a theme throughout our entire conversation. He wasn't as interested in talking about himself as he was about praising others and talking about how proud he is of the young people he's coached and mentored. I think one of the big things for everyone is to leave your place in a better situation than when you started. So if it's the work environment, if it's your local club, you've got to leave it stronger, healthier, uh, more members, members doing well, uh, if they're more than they're what you were before you started. And as a senior athlete, you've got to take the responsibility because you've had the support and now you've got to help others. So I'm now coaching a lot more. I'm coaching uh, a lot of disabled uh, wheelchair athletes, uh, ambulant, cerebral palsy, arm amputees, uh, uh, intellectual athletes with autism and a few other ranges of disabilities, but also aborted athletes. And we've had some great success in the squad. One of my boys, uh, he actually won the half marathon in Japan the other week. So he's uh, pushing pretty well. And to go from a little shy 10-year-old that he was, and when we first met him to overweight, not believing in, uh, he was ever going to be able to do anything, to this guy at 19, he's got a full-time job. He travels the world. He's sponsored and he's winning these major international races at 19, which is pretty incredible and something I could never do back then. So I'm being able to share my experiences and knowledge 
and help shape his future, which has been the best thing. After Beijing in 2008, Richard decided to start traveling more. Of course, he was already traveling, but he was tired of just seeing the airports. He wanted to see the world and explore. So he did tours through Egypt, Russia, Romania, and a bunch of other countries. But the story that struck me most was when he became the first person in a wheelchair to complete the infamous death road in Bolivia. But over there, I did the death road. And yeah, he got a great company who was supportive of me. And we did it and we did it. I, I rode it. I pushed it in my racing chair. Um, I did it with a long group of uh, backpackers in the mountain bikes. Um, and yeah, I, I had it a lot better than most of them because I was so fit and healthy. And there was a couple of heel sections where I just went powering past them. And yeah, they, they were puffing pretty high at four and a half thousand meters. So it was one of the iconic things. And yeah, I, I didn't realize how dangerous it was until I got to South America and I think I was in Lima. And then I started seeing people with injuries and, and stories of the death road. I went, Oh yeah, this is kind of bad. And then when I got up into, up into Bolivia, I got into, into the hostel and I think four of the six in my hostel room had injuries and broken bones and broken leg and uh, from the death road. And I went, yeah, that's not, great um what have i got myself into but i did it and i'm really glad i did because it was one of the craziest adventures i did I, it was actually a lot more dangerous than we thought so i i did it uh now i'm looking for the next wonderful and crazy thing uh i probably won't do as much dangerous stuff as that um I want something with nice warm weather. I'm not a fan of the cold. So if anyone's got any uh, adventure things to do, then yeah, send them through because I'm always looking for something crazy to do. Something in the ultra side of things and I'll have a go. Uh, yeah, I'm looking for something now to have a go at. If you've never seen The Death Road, I strongly encourage you to pause this podcast and look it up. I can't imagine walking it, let alone flying down it in a wheelchair. So I asked Richard if he had any hesitations when he found out about the risks involved. Yeah, you've always got hesitations and you probably get into a self uh, confidence because the first, I think it's 10 kilometers is on this brand new asphalt and it's really nice road and it's smooth and you're like, oh yeah, this is pretty good. And then you come onto the gravel and there's like a thousand meter drop off and then the, the, the road is like two meters wide and you're like, yeah, this is not a safe. Um, I was just trying to do it safely and as, as best I could uh, without causing trouble and not killing myself. And sometimes in races, you got to push the boundaries and you, you push through gaps in the race and you do crash a few times in races. And sometimes you took, take too many risks. And during the death road, I, I was doing it safely and I, I, di I just did it. I was not there to break the world record or anything like that. It was just a, to achieve it and to finish it and uh, survive and not fall off the edge in a thousand meter drop, which is, it happens still to this day. And yeah, I'm glad I got through it. And yeah, it's something that's was done. Um, I wouldn't recommend it to a lot of wheelchair guys, but we did it. And that's the main thing. As you can tell by now, Richard has always been incredibly ambitious. His accomplishments speak for themselves, but they don't tell the full story about all the work that it took to get here. Once I finished high school, I went to university here in Geelong at Deakin and I managed to do part-time university. So it allowed me to be a full-time athlete. I saw so I trained two to three times a day um, for years to, to achieve success. And that's what I needed to do um, to be the number one. And like you win races by 0.03 of a second. And you go, during winter, it's cold, it's dark and it's raining. You're like, is it all worth it? But when you win that race by 0.03 of a second, you're like, yeah, that was what it was worth it. So the main theme of this podcast and of underdogs in general is overcoming failure and coming back better. So I like to ask every guest about a particular moment of failure that helped propel them forward. Richard told me his. We've always got those, those moments and you always learn from it. But yeah, there's always the ones where you crash or you have a bad day and you're like, what happened? And you've got to reflect on it and go, right, that wasn't the greatest thing and learn from it. Um, I've gone into, I think it was London 2012 Paralympics. I went to London six weeks out. I had a major crash in training and like my shoulders in a bad, bad way. And I, I managed to pull through it and just 
do enough. And I was so fit that even having six weeks of injury, like with a bad, like after a really bad crash, um, I managed to get through to London and to do well in London. I managed to win the 800 because I was so confident in my racing and my 800 at the time that that helped, that got me through it. But I was pretty sore. And I remember after I won gold in London, I was back in the village that night, 11 o'clock at night having dinner. And then I would spend the next couple of hours in the ice bars and the physio table. I think that night after I won, I was on the physio table at 1 a.m. And, and then you're up again the next morning back in the ice bar to go again two days later for the next race. And, and by the end of that London Paramix, I was pretty sore, but we got up. Um, I was involved in the relay, the four by 400 uh, wheelchair relay. And the other boys in my team and my roommate, uh, they hadn't had a good meet. And it, that was the hardest thing, seeing them not achieve their goals of having a successful Paramix. And the relay was their last shot as success and we managed to scrape through to the final by point one of a second i think it was and and literally as soon as we made the final i had to leave the stadium and go back to the village and just spend the day on the ice baths and the physio tables and the boys knew how sore i was and i literally had nothing left in the body and I managed to get myself up for the final and more lucky enough to win the bronze and to see the joy and the excitement on their face was one of the greatest things ever. Um, but yeah, as soon as we were done that race, I was cool. I was, I was done. Um, but there has been a lot of challenge along the way. There's been a lot of times when you don't achieve the success. You're out in the cold, the rain, it's, it's not enjoyable when it's minus two degrees and you're out training and that, that's when it's the hardest at the time, uh, I've been through the tough days when you're injured, you're cold, or you've got no money and you're like, how can I afford to go to this next next week? How do you put food on the table? And that's one of the biggest challenges. Um, but it just drives you forward and having those goals written out and visible and got to take action on them, that's, that's what keeps you going. Like every great athlete, Richard has a deeply rooted desire that continues to drive him forward. Sometimes, hey, it doesn't happen. And... Not every athlete is going to be world record holder or a Premier gold medalist. And and for me, I've been lucky to win a Premier gold medal, but I've finished second or third and been under the world record more than 10 times. I've never once held a world record. I've always been pipped on the line and the guy's broken the world record. So and that's what one of the things that drives me is going, hey, I want to have my name with that WR next to it, even if it's for one heat or for five minutes and somebody else takes it it's true that's that's what keeps driving me and so um some of these boys are keep going and they're getting stronger as they get older but it's uh yeah we're all having fun around the world in 2014 richard was made a member of the order of australia for his significant service to sport as a gold medalist and to his community yeah, it's a huge honor in australia has all these different honors same as england and with their the ones the when they Queen gives out honours to um, MBEs and knighthoods and all those, just do a whole lot of different levels. Uh, and that's where Australia has kind of got different recognitions for doing services to different things, community and uh, media and all different areas. And uh, I've been very honoured to be recognised for the things I do in the community and, and the disability world and, and trying to be a leader of disability and trying to take action and help people achieve success and trying to change perceptions of people with disability and so it's we've come a long way but we've gone there we've got a long way to go as well so we've got a lot of work to do nowadays richard's working on a lot of different things all centered around what he enjoys most helping others uh, I'm working full time with the National Disability Insurance Agency here in Geelong, which is a government organisation which is doing disability. Uh, it's a disability organisation here in Australia. We we're, we're changing the face of disability in Australia. So great thing to work there. But it's also I'm out helping other people with disability achieve success. And as I said, we got 40% living below the poverty line. 80% of people with disability don't meet the recommended targets for physical activity per week and we've got to get people active and included but we've also got to break down barriers of the community and going right 
why do we have shops with steps at the front? Why are we've got barriers to be included? And why is there so many uh, barriers for people with disability to be involved? And, and I'm trying to break that down, uh, raise awareness. Um, I'm trying to train hard now at the moment as well. And getting fit, I raced in Japan the other week and that was such a great trip. And I'm now back, back into full-time training as well. So trying to do that do the marketing, raise awareness of my, my, my image my, as an athlete, mentor, a disability awareness person. Um, so across social media, I've got a lot of things happening and you can always see that there. Uh, always through my blogging, my newsletters. Uh, we've got a great thing happening at the moment there. Um, so there's a lot happening in my world and there's always new ideas that I'm going to work on and I'll be releasing things and everyone will see those announcements soon. So it's going to be great. Huge thanks to Richard Coleman for joining me on the show to share his story. I left this conversation so inspired and I hope his story made you feel the same way. If you'd like to keep up with Richard and support what he's got going on, you can subscribe to his monthly newsletter over at his website, coleman.com.au. That's C-O-L-M-A-N.com.au. Whether it's your first time or you've been on this ride with us for a while, thank you so much for tuning in. And always remember, Hustle and Motivate is presented by JokerMag.com, the home of the underdog.